I think that the planet's going to be fine. I don't know if homo sapiens are going to be around for a whole lot longer, but um, maybe that's part of it. You know, we, we learned, I mean, there's, there's multiple species of humans. I think that even for me, for so many of us, it's so hard to conceptualize the fact that there are these much broader cycles of life on this planet than what we imagine. I mean, this is 2023. That's just the last 2000 years. There's like you said, we're talking, you know, 50 million years ago, there were dinosaurs and extinction events. There's potentially this meteoric event 12,800 years ago, the younger Dryas impact. And there's all of these cycles that are much bigger than what we're doing. And this idea that there's what 400 and I don't know how many parts per million uh, carbon right now on the planet. I mean, four, 450, 460, 480. Uh, but there have been times on the planet when there have been a thousand or 2,500 parts per million of carbon, you know, maybe a billion years ago or hundreds of millions of years ago. So there's, there's all this life and death and these cycles on the planet. This is interesting to think that like the planet does this and it could potentially regreen. And this idea, I love this idea of the earth breathing. I never thought about it that way, but I want people to understand that by that, I think what you're referring to is the fact that the earth can inhale this carbon back into the soil. And that's kind of what regenerative agriculture does. It can fix the carbon from the atmosphere, but there's carbon in the atmosphere now that the earth can then inhale in a very big way in the future. And as it inhales it back into the soil, that can become life. And, and when there's more carbon in the atmosphere, there are more trees and there's more greenery in some ways. I think that the problem we often run into here is that people will conflate carbon in the atmosphere with the particulate pollution that goes along with it. And that, those are not the same thing at all. I mean, sometimes more carbon in the atmosphere can be good for plants and, and the, the earth can manage this carbon cycle in, in so many ways. Uh, I think that glyphosate in the air, uh, that benzene and organic solvents in the air, these are problematic for humans, but carbon is a much more complex topic than most of our political commentators would have us believe. And I think you're right. I think a lot of rhetoric gets spouted about carbon in the atmosphere and decisions get made that are, that are perhaps misleading. So let's, let's return to like an individual focus for a moment because I want people to have some actionable tools from your perspective. We spent the first half an hour of this podcast talking about the pervasiveness of glyphosate, the problems at the, at the, the gap, the gap junctions, the epithelium on the inside of the gut, potentially the epithelium, these, these you know, tight junctions at, at every membrane of our body, whether it's our lung, alveoli, whether it's the inside of our blood vessels or the blood vein barrier. We talked a little bit about this organic produce or the organic foods, the quality of your food, but like what else can humans do? So if someone's listening to this and they're going, oh my God, there's glyphosate everywhere. What steps do you take in your life? What do we do here, Zach, from your perspective yeah. to, to live in this world where we've got glyphosate everywhere? I mean, I guess people could look on a map and say, where's the lowest glyphosate in the world? I'm moving to Iceland. I don't even know if it's low there. I'm just guessing. But what, what do we do? Yeah. Yeah. The journey has been interesting. When we first started in 2018, you know, we were going to be prescriptive. Stop doing this and go do this, you know, uh, you know, and even when by 2020, when we launched, you know, a lot of our programming around farmers footprint and all of this, we really had this belief that if we told people enough information that they should go do this instead, then we would all be okay. And what slowly happened is that my clinical world of, of medicine started to merge with this farming you know, kind of food systems experience in that over a, a 25 year history as a medical doctor, I started to realize that there is no extrinsic thing that I can give a patient. Drugs were my first training. I spent 17 years in academic medicine. I was a chemotherapy development you know, guy at, at the University of Virginia developing the next generation of chemotherapy. So I was pharmaceutical all the way. Like I was developing the future of pharmaceutical industry. I was so passionate about it. I was just convinced we were going to solve everything. And in that journey, it was actually my patients that started to show me that no matter how good my chemotherapy got, I was never going to stop this huge deluge of cancer that was starting to emerge from the population. And it was one of my patients that was in my very first clinical trial with this new drug that I had developed that she was literally the first one, six capsules in her hand. And I'm trying to convince her to swallow these new capsules, this new drug. And she finally, you know, in her, in her deep intuition says, what do these six capsules have to do with the reason I got cancer? And suddenly 17 years of education came screaming to a, a brick wall, you know, collision. And I suddenly realized that absolutely nothing in those capsules had anything to do with why she got cancer over the last decades. And, and that was a devastating moment psychologically for me. I, I drove home that night. I drove to the hospital that night thinking I was in elation. I was like, 
admitting my first patient of the first clinical trial with this new drug, and I was going to be famous, and this was going to be so good, breakthrough for people needing this drug all over the world. And I left in the deepest sense of despair because I had so radically missed the target, which was similar to that moment of everybody needs organic, and then you find out organic soil can be worse than the conventional thing, and you crash again. Like, so my life has been kind of these deconstructions by, by mode of brute force collision with brick walls of reality that have helped me back to this realization that there is no prescription for the future. There's no prescription of how you should eat, where you should live, how you should do this. Instead, there is an experience of connection. And so that happens at the individual level. And so now we've pivoted from, you know, we got to do all this stuff and farming and of that to we need to start meeting one-on-one in groups of human beings and start to have an experiential experience, maybe in an intimate one-on-one experience or maybe in small groups and ultimately at community levels of this transformation that happens inside of us when we remember we are from here. We are actually of this earth. We are of this soil. We are of this nature that is speaking through us. And so your individual journey has to begin at that deep question of, did I get kicked out of nature or am I, have I always been in this nature? That has to resolve within you if you expect your future lifestyle to actually match the, the value system and biologic reality of the nature you live within. Because if you don't solve that deep wound of rejection, and that, then you're not going to solve the scarcity mentality that drives us towards this extraction and competitiveness and kind of destruction, colonialism model of human expression. You could go fix the way you, you go buy food at the farmer's market instead of the grocery store or something like this, but you're still going to be consuming at a rate that's destroying the planet in different ways. And so it's really this deep reevaluation of who am I and where do I hail from? What do I have to, to express here? Why did I come here at this moment? It's kind of unique. Humans have been around 300,000 years and yet you picked this decade to be in the state that you'd even be listening to this podcast. Why are you here listening to this podcast? You must be in some sort of deep relationship back to nature that's calling you to be part of this transition of humanity into our new expression. You would not be listening to this. This would not have come into your consciousness had you not been part of the solution. And so I deeply believe that on a quantum physics level is there is no particle in the universe out of place. There is no mistake happening within the cosmos right now. Instead, nature is iterating, expressing, iterating, expressing, and showing more and more beauty, intelligence, and therefore more capacity to see that beauty and therefore vibrate in this vibration that we might call love. This is why we are here, is to experience an integrated nature within us, to witness nature without, outside of us and within us, and start to see each other in the context of this beauty and start to treat each other radically different. These wars that are, are burning in our media right now, are the, I hope, the last mirror we need. Do we really need cycles that can cycle every five or 10 years showing us the conflict of humans that is so severe that we would think it reasonable to behead each other's children, burn each other in the streets, bombing our cities into oblivion? How many more mirrors are we going to need to show us that it's our macro behavior reflecting this micro belief of rejection that is the revolving door of of the annihilation of humans against humans, humans against our planet, humans against the very nature that we're built from. How many more mirrors are we going to need before we hit that wall? And so I hope that today is like one of those walls that just stops you in your tracks and makes you realize I need to reevaluate absolutely everything. My job, my relationships to family, my relationships to my land, my relationships to self. I need to reevaluate all of that. And it's going to have to begin in this internal journey into who are you, where do you come from, and what are you here to express? And that's going to take a lot of listening rather than doing. This is the opportunity where we realize, wow, we we went down a long avenue, 70,000-year epoch wrapping up. The current estimates is that we have about 60 harvests left on the planet with our current treatment of soils globally. 60 harvests left. There's no technological, you know, lab grown meat that's going to get us out of this situation. This is the destruction of nutrients on the planet, not just, you know, fresh food. This is the destruction of at the base of of the vitality of the microbiome. We have 60 harvests left. If you look at human fertility and the collapse of it, 
the sperm counts in all Western countries globally, all industrialized countries have dropped by 52 to 62 percent over the last 40 years. One in three males is now infertile in, in our industrialized world. The only place in the world that we see sperm counts starting to slowly recover from previous baselines is Africa. And so I believe that's on purpose, too, because I mentioned that, that the regreening of this planet occurs and it happens in Africa. It turns out that the, the birth canal of this planet, from a microbiology standpoint to a macro ecology standpoint, is in Africa. That birth canal starts at the tip of Africa, where it touches the Ethiopian Ocean, which basically extends down to the Antarctica from the tip of Africa. That big triangular ocean seems to be the womb of all of the biologic mix of, of viruses and new genetic potential. And so that something about that ocean and the energy that it has with the energetics of the planet functions as a womb. And where it touches land uh, near the, the southeastern tip of South Africa, we see the birth canal of life. And so the microbes move from ocean to land. And we saw the first life there in a place that's called the cradle of life. And then about 330 kilometers from there, the cradle of humanity. And so we can see these original, uh, you know, emergences of life all the way from the first bacteria 3 billion years ago to humanity just 300,000 years ago. And so these billions of years of birth of life out of, uh, out of this birth canal of Africa seeded everything up into the world. And so if you follow that line up, it's actually a single longitudinal energy line on the planet that runs from that tip of life all the way up through Egypt and the three pyramids of Giza are right on that line, run that up to Scandinavia and you've got Stonehenge and all the original things. And so the original peoples that predated our current history knew that this was the energetic birthplace of life on planet. And we needed to tune the planet and maybe the cosmos uh, through this energetic line to continue to, you know, consolidate energy and new potential for life. So we've been dancing on this meridian for hundreds of thousands of years of human history, and we're starting to rediscover this meridian scientifically, emotionally, and spiritually. We're all coming back to our, our indigenous birthplace. Every single human is African, period. We all came from this one place, and then there was a diaspora about 100,000 years into our history where we started to learn how to do transportation, distribution. We started moving continents and all of this, but that, that was 100,000 years where we were all there. And then the, the genetics started to distribute to the planet. And so we are all iterative versions of African blood, African homeland. And if you've never been to Africa, I, I strongly encourage you to go see at least a sunset in Africa. That was a big reset in my life. The first sunset I saw in Africa was my first cellular awakening that I am from planet Earth. I have a deep cellular remembrance all the way back to the beginning of my humanity that is is ignited by the colors and, and distribution of patterns that happen uniquely in those African sunsets. So go back to our origin place if you get the opportunity, Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa. Go back into some of these, the Ethiopian Rift Valley. If you get the chance to go back into these places, I guarantee you will, something will be ignited in you that will be irrepressible because you're here right now at the rebirth of humanity. And I think for us to really, truly rebirth, we're going to have to come to a remembrance of where we have been, a forgiveness of our path, and a rebirth through grace, where we leave behind fear, guilt, shame paradigms in our relationship to nature so that we can re-express humanity before we go extinct. With one third of our population already infertile by sperm count, we have about 60 to 80 years left of human species for reproduction capacity. And again, in vitro fertilization is a just abandoned at the end of the hospice journey of our species. The proteins and structures within those sperm are being degraded elementally. And so right now you can maybe get pregnant if you stick it in a test tube, but in the next two decades with the continued accumulation of the epigenetic downstream, there's no sperm on the planet that has the capacity for that rebirth event to happen. And so I'm, as horrible as those numbers are, 60 harvests left, 80 years of human fertility left, we are on our hospice moment because we should be, because we have created this opportunity for ourselves. We have created the opportunity to completely transform as the only method of survival. Uh, there is no linear path towards recovery because we carry too much epigenetic and genetic trauma from the generations before us that have been living out this divorce from our nature.